Yeah, it's okay for me. All right. Um, so today we're going to be talking about some problems and solutions in deep learning. A uh, uh, quick word before is that this work is based in the work of uh, Shai Shalef Schwartz uh, from the Hebrew University in Israel. So for the original paper with all the, the mathematics and details, uh, you can consult them here. Uh, so first we're going to talk about neural networks because uh, that's our main focus. And neural networks gets confused with artificial intelligence and machine learning, uh, but they're different things. So first thing is to differentiate between artificial intelligence as agents, uh, machine learning as an algorithm that uh, expects to teach uh, uh, an algorithm with data and deep learning, which is a technique in machine learning using uh, deep neural networks. So let's talk first about machine learning. Uh, in machine learning, we try to learn an objective function f uh, using a data set, which has some inputs and some outputs that we know that are correct. And uh, this, we're going to try to learn an approximated function with some parameters w. Uh, and we're going to optimize this W iterative uh, using optimization on the cost function. This cost function can vary depending on the problem, but normally it would be something like a measure, like a distance measure. So in this case, it is a distance measure, and we just take the gradient with respect to the parameters, and we optimize. Uh, there's another uh, key concept we're going to use later on, which is precision. Uh, so once we know uh, we have uh, an approximated function, we might want to know how well it's performing. Uh, this precision tells us just that, uh, how much of, uh, of the percentage of the answers were correct. The, how the neural networks work. So neural networks are part of, of, of machine learning. So they optimize and work in a similar ma manner. So uh, the way we optimize for uh, other uh, machine learning techniques is very similar. In this case, uh, the main difference is how we structure our, uh, our system, uh, which is based on neurons. These neurons are based on uh, this linear transformation and then an activation function which cannot be linear. Uh, common activation function can be the uh, rectify linear unit or ReLU. Uh, and it's normally uh, uh, based on inputs, outputs, and hidden layers. The more hidden layers, the deeper it is. So deep ne neural networks just means a lot of layers. Another key concept is epoch, which is training all the data uh, once. So we go through all the data and we use that to optimize our our uh, our neural network, but just once. Uh, an important uh, characteristic of neural networks is that they're universal proxy approximates. <laughs> uh, they can simulate any function, any continuous function with any degree of error we want given enough, uh, uh, enough deep, uh, yeah, given that they are enough deep. Uh, the thing, how we optimize uh, the, how, or how we make uh, neural networks, it starts with the data set. So we uh, partition data set between training and test. We will train our black box and then we will measure that black box with our test data, and then we will adjust the model and keep on going until this black box gets better and better and better. But this adjusting the model is kind of weird because there's not a, a, a one and only thing you can do to adjust your model. So we're gonna talk about that in this presentation. Normally, since they can approximate any continuous function, we just think, well, they need more data or they need more computation power. But what if that is not an option? What if we already have enough 
computational power, what if we have enough data already and it's not working? So today I want to talk about what happens when uh, a neural network uh, is not optimizing properly, even with enough data and computational power. To talk about this, we're going to have a little methodology where we'll take a real problem, we will simplify it, we will see that the problem, uh, the simplified problem has a perfect solution, and we will see that the perfect solution cannot be reached uh, by some uh, method of neural network, of optimizing neural network, and then we will see what can we learn from that method that failed and from what method that didn't fail, and how can we improve on, on our deep learning abilities. So the first problem is that data and computational power does not mean learning. So imagine uh, you have some cancer data set and you have information regarding uh, the location, the size, the age of the patient. I just want to know, is it uh, a bad tumor or not? Is it cancerigenous? Cancerigenous. Well, uh, this problem can be simplified in a more uh, easy to handle manner by the parity problem, which is just we have some neurons, uh, I mean some some vector, binary vector, which is consisting of one and zeros. And now we're going to see if it's an odd or an even number of ones. So here will be one, two, three, four, even. But now we're going to complicate things using a mask. So we will have uh, only counting the ones with masks. So one, this one doesn't count. Two, this one doesn't count. Again, even. And this problem will give us an opportunity to look at the other uh, problem, which is just a classification problem in one and zero, but in a more, much more uh, easy way. So formal definition would be that having binary vectors, we will take the inner product and elevate minus one to that inner product. Uh, the thing about this problem is that it can be solved with one hidden layer. We only need one hidden layer and it will be solved perfectly. You can make the, the, the weights, uh, you can choose them in order to make them perfect. Uh, so since there is a solution and there is enough data, it's just a matter of giving it enough computational power, right? But the answer is not really. When you use different optimizers, uh, the answer, the, the, the neural net will not always come to the same answer. So using some common uh, optimizer like a stochastic gradient descent here in orange, you can see it never went above uh, 0 0.5 meaning it was always random. While using some other optimizer like Adam, uh, it went almost perfect accuracy. So there's a difference between using uh, different optimizers and getting the result. Even if they have the same computational power, even if you leave them for months and months and months, some optimizers will just never optimize. And uh, we can see the difference in the parameters change. So here we're seeing how much did one parameter change from one step to the other. In the case of Adam, it it shows that it changed a lot comparing to a stochastic gradient descent. So we might think that a stochastic gradient descent is not changing enough. And that would be correct. Uh, if we change the learning rate at the beginning and make it slow decrease, it will uh, give it enough learning capabilities to learn at the start, but then don't fall into noise because this is just noise. So we have to decrease against the learning rate in order to make it uh, uh, learn uh, a good neural net. Um, so here we learn that only data and computational power is not enough. We need a good optimizer. And an optimizer that is good for our specific problem, not just any optimizer. And that uh, hyperparameters 
matter. So learning rates in case of Adam is like beta one, beta two, those things matter and they might affect if your neural net learns or not. Next problem is uh, neural networks from end to end are problematic. So let's think of a problem of a self-driving car. Uh, we might want to say, okay, there's some people walking on the street and I want to know if I should stop the car or not. So that's a problem. We have some people on the street and we want to know, should I go or not? Tell me if there's people on the street. There's one way when we can just put the neural net to learn when there's people on the street and when there's not people on the street, and it might work, but it will not give us uh, the result and and uh, an interpretation of interpretability that we're expecting from it. So we'll see that with a simple example. Let's think of uh, a line. This is a line, a pixelated line, but a line. It's going downwards, so we will say it has a minus one. This one's going upwards, so we will say this one has a one. Uh, and now we're thinking, well, I want to solve for two images if it's uh, the parity problem. So how many ones there is? Uh, simple problem, I could just give two images uh, on top of each other, train the neural network with the end result, and that would be it. But there's another solution, which is decomposing the problem. We know there's a step in the middle here, which is identifying uh, the slope of the line. In this case, we want to first learn the slope and then solve the parity problem. When we do, the, when we do that, we have this, this composition problem where we have uh, the accuracy for the first image, the accuracy for the second image, and the final accuracy. And it learns uh, fairly quickly and fairly well. On other, uh, on the other side, when we start with just the parity problem and we do not give it in insights about how to solve it, it will sometimes work, and in this case, very fast and very well, and sometimes it won't with the same data, with the same uh, optimizer, with the same architecture, it won't work because it's not able to uh, have the clue that the other uh, neural network have. So a more realistic solution to our uh, problem of finding whether we should pass or not the street is identifying the the people, not just identifying if they're on the street with a one and zero, but identifying where exactly are they. So decomposing the problem, even if it's a lengthier process, it's more interpretable. And that's uh, the next learning that we have. Decomposing is key to uh, to making a, a, a good neural network. The next problem is that a bad architecture uh, implies extra time. And here, uh, the thing is that we normally think it bad architecture as something that just won't work. But most of the time, it will work, but it will work slower. And in, my, in, in times when we have neural networks learning for two or three months, uh, waiting another four extra months for a bad decision seems like a very heavy cost. So let's look at our real problem. Real problem would be audio recognition. So we have a signal here and we want to classify it in a word. That's fairly simple. Another way of looking at it is we want uh, to transform this uh, function, this linear function, well, linear uh, on part, uh, to something uh, different relatable. So uh, what we will do is a transformation, starting with the same, with the first number is zero always, and then looking at the uh, at the previous point to see how much the slope changed. 
In this case, the slope didn't change, so zero again. In this case, the slope changed one, so one. And in this case, the slope changed minus two. It's one, zero, and minus one, so minus two. And we go and do the same for the rest of the uh, the line, uh, the function, sorry. So if we want to transform this uh, function, we might think, OK, I can do it with a matrix. And in fact, you can. It's just a matter of uh, multiplying the and re the points in the function, the integer points, with this matrix, and it will work. But uh, this matrix has a characteristic, the uh, a particularity, sorry, that uh, it's more of a convolution that really a matrix multiplication. So we could use convolutional neural networks, and that's exactly what we're going to do. So on one, one side, we have using a dense neural network, which will have to learn that complicated matrix. Then we have a convolutional neural network uh, that only need three parameters, and it will achieve perfect score. And then we have a deep learning approach. So deep learning and dense neural networks did not perform as well and spend more time optimizing and wait a lot more since they have more parameters. So the architecture here, this is not only means that it will not work, because dense will eventually get perfect, but it will not uh, uh, do it in the same amount of time as a good architecture would. So the next thing we learn is that a good architecture helps us with time. Uh, lastly, at the start, I mentioned how all, all of this is based on gradient. So we take a gradient of some cost function, and that's about it. But in reality, gradient of descent is not the only way of optimizing, and not the only way of optimizing neural networks, for that matter. So let's think of uh, classifying people according to uh, their economical status. So we have uh, one, two, three, four, five, six. There's more people in two and three than there's in six, and it's a blurry line, right? When exactly does the amount of income represents uh, going up in the in the hierarchy? So we're going to represent that with this function, which is uh, a floor function, but only in certain numbers. So only on 17, on 20.5, uh, 23 point something, only then is going to go to floor of selected numbers. And now we're going to take a, a, a linear function and pass it through here. We know that we can uh, solve this fairly easy because it is a somewhat continuous function, but let's look at what happens. So if we take it as a regression problem, it will have a lot of problems with uh, the the limits. And even if it's doing a good job, it's not perfect. With uh, a multi-class approach, it just doesn't care about the small, uh, uh, the small data sets. But we have an alternative method, which is not based on gradient descent, which actually optimizes uh, faster, which takes into account the, the smaller uh, stat hierarchy status, and uh, it it optimizes faster and better. So our last uh, tip would be that a different optimizer might uh, be a good option, but this is more for uh, future work is you cannot just take any, uh, there's no library to just implement it straight on, on your neural network. Lastly, as a conclusion, I want to say that data and, and computational power is not everything when it comes to neural networks. There's other things that matter. There's architecture, there's uh, how do you assemble your data. And, and we've seen that through this presentation. So I want you to leave knowing that you need more than just brute force the problem. Thank you.
Yeah, very nice. Okay, great. Okay, uh, uh, do you have any question? Okay, I, I have one first one comment and then one question. And the first comment is that uh, when uh, when when the people goes to neuronal networks, the the main um, the the main task is uh, trying and trying different architectures, and most of the time they don't have any clue how to proceed with the problems they have. And this is one of the, the, the reasons because we need to develop a theory around this 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 stuff because we are losing a lot of uh, energy, a lot of money, a lot of time just uh, fishing uh, in, in these large uh, neuronal network architectures. This kind of tips uh, that uh, Gabriel was, was telling us are quite useful if you try to deal with a real problem. And the nice thing is that those 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 tips are based on a grounded theory. There is a, there is a, a theorem that basically say that you can solve this part of the problem uh, based on the uh, on, on, on neuronal networks. And, 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 and if you have the, the, the true solution, then something uh, some, you are missing something when you are uh, working with this stuff. Uh, I mean, with the with the real use of neuronal networks, and that, that's very nice because I, I think this 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 should be one of the uses of the mathematics, and uh, mathematics sh should be there just to make good solutions. And this is just the 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 the, the, uh, the peak of the the kind of things a theory can do for machine learning. There are a lot of problems that are still there, and uh, as soon as we start to solve these problems, uh, probably we will. Uh, we will use these these things uh, uh, properly because right now things we have like like are like Frankenstein's millions and millions of parameters and we basically buy a lot of hardware just to optimize these things and uh, yeah it works but uh, which is the cost of making this is you, if you can do good theory just to uh, have good decisions okay this is this is like one message and. Uh, I, I, I was thinking that this 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 kind of messages that it's quite are important and just in the presentation no but you you already have it here in the conclusion and you you no there is no question for my side okay any question Juan Sebastian have a question yes thank you Gabriel for your presentation it was fantastic work I want to know more details about the the composition phase. Uh, I, I don't have clear how how works the workflow for the for this phase of the composition. I don't know if if you need some prior knowledge from an expert uh, tagging or how how to how how works the, this phase of the composition. I'm not sure about the question, but you mean like this problem, the decomposition of the problem. Yeah, yeah. For example, you you select uh, in the Beatles picture uh, some kind of, of uh, how how to make the the, the squirt that detects uh, people is like automatically generated or with a previous algorithm or tagging with a, an expert. Uh, yeah. So here we you need more data than before. So you have to take the extra time to tagging and uh, making a data set of the uh, new data, like you change the whole problem. But that changing of problem is to give it an opportunity to to the neural net to actually learn. Because you could not do it, like counting fish on an image. Let's say you want to count fish on an image. You might have a lot of images, and you might say like, this one's three, this one's four, this one's six. If you go through a neural net, it might be able to work, but when it fails, you won't be able to tell why. So if you don't treat it as a counting problem on an image, but more like an object detection problem, you will be able to see how it's failing, why it's failing, what you should improve. Okay, but this depends on, on in this case, uh, tagging pictures, uh, something like that, yeah? Yeah, so giving insights about the information you have. In this case, you say like the, uh, the, the slope on, on here is important. 
uh, another problem that was treated by Joshua Bengio, which is very similar to this, is the a Tetris problem. So he, he has like multiple uh, uh, Tetris uh, figures in an image, and he wants the machine to answer whether or not uh, all the figures are the same. So it's kind of a similar problem in the sense that we start with a simple idea that is identifying figures, and then we we ask a different thing, which is mark much more complicated, which is uh, if all of them are the same. And the way he he approached the problem is saying, if you just take uh, the final answer, you you will not be able to make a neural network. But if you take intermediate steps, so you you say, okay, I'm going to give you information about how to classify an, uh, uh, a Tetris figure. And now I'm going to give you the next problem, which is very hard. Then it will be able to learn and perform almost perfectly, but you need to give them those insights. Okay, so this needs an um, attacking uh, process, yeah? But uh, I was thinking in, in how to incorporate uh, prior knowledge uh, uh, because uh, these pretty curated data sets are very very limited so so i don't know if is if, if there are a way to to incorporate previous knowledge in, in deep learning approach to to improve the the, the models uh, or there's some idea in this direction uh, maybe with uh, transfer learning because like in the problem with Joshua Benjo, he didn't exactly tag all the images the way uh, I did here, but more like uh, first it teach him how to identify Tetris figure, not to solve the bigger problem, just identifying Tetris figure. So he created a, an entire other data set. That is part of the work, like creating data sets is, is like a big part of the work. And, and you know that most of the time, like you spend more time doing the data sets and, and curating data sets than actually working on modeling. Thank you. Thank you for your answer, Gabriel. Thank you. I have a answer. Yeah, yeah, Camilo, go ahead. Um, I, there exists a, a method to, um, to choose a correct architecture or a correct uh, optimization method or you have to try and fail miserably uh, again and again? So for the optimizer bit, is uh, is not that is this one sure method, but uh, most of the op optimizer methods are quite similar. So uh, for example, Adam is based on uh, RMS prop, but different. So it works better uh, than stochastic gradient descent for most of the problems you will find. So my recommendation for optimizers is always go for them and learn how to use it and learn how to uh, tune its hyperparameters because it's not hyperparameter free. It's still like a beta one and like a beta two. And you go like, what is a beta? So you need to understand what is doing and how you should interact with it. For the architecture bit, uh, it's it's a little bit more complicated because there's not one sure method where you say like, all right, this is uh, definitely what we should do. In this case, is a structured data. And when you have a structured data, you normally don't use uh, a neural network. But most of the time that you're using neural networks, you're using it on something that's already been used. So images, audio files, something like that. In that case, or time sequences, in that case, you should look at the literature of what they're using and how they got the results. Because uh, for this image, for example, it is an image, so you go like, it's a Linet network. And you go like, what is a Linet network? It's like a convolutional network that uh, one of the parents of deep learning make in his time. And it's now very useful for small images. So just reading about literature is is like your way to go in architecture. 
Okay, thank you. Okay, very nice. Uh, any other question? If you want to ask in Spanish, there is no problem. I, I have another question. Uh, Go ahead. Um, um, Gabriel, uh, what would be more cheaper in time and um, in money for a for a company to improve a model? There, I I think in a workflow of of steps that it, maybe I can spend a lot of time tagging and creating a a pre data set, or maybe I can uh, skip that phase and and, and create a, an architect a new architecture. I don't know how, how do you see uh, this workflow or something like that. So uh, in terms of economy, it's it's complicated. When when I worked uh, with uh, with high tech, you know it. Uh, I proposed like creating a new data set because we needed it. But what they did was not paying my salary to tag, but pay a cheaper salary to, to tag that. And there's automatic and online ways of creating data sets. So you go to Amazon and they and then you like pay people to tag your things and whatnot. So that thing can be the data generation problem is like an entirely different problem. Uh, you can solve them with uh, online tools, crowdsourcing, uh, and then working on something like, I'm going to work a lot in improving the architecture so we don't have to pay a lot of costs in, uh, in like computing, like not renting so much GPUs. It's also complicated in the sense that sometimes you will be just working for uh, diminishing returns. So you go like, I can improve this little tiny bit of the architecture and and you might spend one or two months in something that didn't really improve too much. So what I would recommend is like uh, work on a level that is easy to work next because you're not normally doing things that will have to be improved and worked on later on. So if what you did can be worked on later on and improve, go for that, because you will have to keep doing both. Thank you, Daniel. Oh, that's a very nice recommendation. Any other question? I'm going to switch to Spanish. Um, yo creo que aquí hay estudiantes y estas cosas que están hasta ahorita familiarizándose. Eh, el tra este trabajo es bastante chévere porque Realmente Gabriel lo trajo, es de las pocas veces que yo dije un, Gabriel, un trabajo donde un estudiante lo propone, me pareció bacano, y lo trajo porque Gabriel eh, arrancó hace algún tiempo, eh, o sea, estaba en la universidad y empezó a trabajar con nosotros, lo mismo que eh, Juan Sebastián esta cosa, y Gabriel se movió a la industria a hacer un, un internship, y, y, y duró siempre un tiempo allá y estaba haciendo cosas de estas, y, y, y tal vez me gustaría preguntarle, eh, primero, ¿cuál fue su experiencia trabajando? Porque... Eso es muy importante. ¿Cuál fue su experiencia trabajando en la industria y por qué, por qué encontró y por qué propuso ese problema que me pareció de entrada bastante extraño? Pero lo sacó adelante y estaba complicada la cosa porque no se veía tan claro, tan claro por dónde iba el agua al molino. Pero me gustaría que, y sobre todo y en España, que nos comentara un poco su experiencia moviéndose a la industria, haciendo cosas de estas y, y por qué quiso traer el trabajo que nunca le pregunté eso. Y dije que sí, porque lo conozco, pero... Eh, pero me pareció raro. Eh, con, con lo de la industria, pues, bueno, en realidad, el que primero me acercó a la industria fue su merced. Siempre me, como que tenía cosas ahí por hacer y necesitaba estudiantes. Y bueno, después, que fue como cuando estuve un poquito más independiente en Twilio, que era una empresita más grande que las otras. Eh, una empresita, pero esa cosa tiene... ¿Cuántos empleados tiene esa vaina? Como 3.000. Por eso, es, es, tú y yo, es que yo nunca entendí que hace esa cosa, pero gana mucha plata. Eso es lo que hacen, es como... Como que tiene unos paquetes ahí para cosas de comunicación. Yo nunca les entendí eso que te por... Sí, es eh, ayudarle a las empresas a enviar mensajes de textos, correos, llamadas. Como cuando usted le pide un rap y le dice como... Eh, tu Rappi te está esperando, por favor revisa el app, que lo llaman a uno. Eso lo hace 
uno o cuando uno se va a meter algo y le mandan un código de verificación. El equipo en donde yo trabajaba eran los que enviaban esos códigos de verificación. Eh, y, y pues ahí lo que aprendí fue a ser, a ser organizado. Esa gente piensa mucho en, no tanto en qué, tanto lo, lo, qué tan rápido lo puedo hacer, sino qué tan mantenible lo puedo hacer. Entonces, si uno va a hacer algo, tiene que pasar por muchos protocolos para que no dañe absolutamente nada y además para que cuando llegue alguien que no sepa del tema pueda verlo y decir como listo, por aquí es. Eso fue como lo principal que nosotros casi no teníamos en cuenta, como que siempre teníamos un deadline y decíamos, le damos con toda, terminamos el deadline y, y nos olvidamos de eso. Eh, ahí era más de mantenimiento y de meter features de a poquito, pero más que todo mantener el servicio estable. Y en cuanto al problema, eh, no sé, es que cuando comencé con, con redes neuronales fue, fue extraño porque simplemente me, me, me botó a un, a un problema que, que necesitaba redes neuronales y me dijo, esas son redes neuronales convolucionales. Y, y le di muchas vueltas mucho tiempo y no sabía por dónde avanzar. Entonces dije... Es que ¿cuál es el problema de las hojitas, ¿cierto? Sí. sí. <risa> eh, entonces dije, algún día tengo que, que mirar cómo uno debería analizar eso detenidamente. Y, y bueno... Encontré ese artículo, me gustó mucho y, y lo trabajé. Listo, chévere. Gabriel es un buen ejemplo de que la teoría y la, y la práctica no son cosas diferentes. O sea, si uno quiere hacer cosas, tiene que tener una buena fundamentación teórica y la teoría, generalmente la buena teoría va de la mano de problemáticas interesantes. Por ejemplo, este artículo de Gabriel eso es un, un grupo súper, súper reputado y eso es estado del arte, el que revisó Gabriel y el que reprodujo ese estado del arte en, en Theoretical Machine Learning. O sea, esos tipos son los que están moviendo esa cosa y no se, no lo hacen, por ejemplo, lo que va a decir, fumándose la verde, sino lo hacen pegado a problemas que, que realmente tienen sentido y cada una de esas cosas se convierte en, en dinero eh, y, y, y tiene unos desarrollos teóricos bastante interesantes por detrás. Entonces, eh, yo creo que la última vez que, que yo quería las gracias a Gabriel, porque Gabriel ahorita se va y después yo creo que se va a quedar allá. Algo me lo dice... Entonces, seguramente muy poca, se va a ser una de las últimas presentaciones que va a hacer como estudiante acá. Eh, ha sido muy bacano trabajar con Gabriel durante estos años, me ha enseñado un montón, ¿no? Eh, y, y es muy chévere ver cómo, cómo, cómo ha crecido y cómo ha avanzado. Eh, y nada, darle las gracias por, 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 el, por el tiempo que pasó con nosotros y esperar que cuando regrese o si se queda por allá, pues no, no pierda el contacto y, y que siga aprendiendo porque... O sea, de esas personas que uno dice, uy, este man puede llegar súper, súper lejos. Eh, y hay, hay muchos en el grupo así, pero usted es una de esas personas que uno dice, uy, este man, yo lo veo en unos años en un sitio bastante bueno, o dirigiendo una empresa, o haciendo cosas muy bacanas, sobre todo que lo hagan feliz. ¿Listo, Gabriel? Porque ya después no va a tener la oportunidad de decirle eso, y, y yo creo que lo que les decía, eh, Gabriel, esos ejemplos donde uno dice, este man hace las cosas bien hechas y le gusta lo que hace. Gracias, Gabriel. No, profe, gracias a usted. ¿Cuánto tiempo ha invertido en mí? Eh, no, igual, eh, cuando, cuando termine eso, su Mercedes sigue siendo mi tutor y haré esta presentación de lo que hice allá. Ah, bueno, bueno. Pero bueno, no, pero ya usted sale y si sale como el primer científico de la computación del país, pues eso sería severo, para, perdón por la expresión, pero eso es severo logro. Porque usted de esos más que uno dice, este tipo... Gente como ustedes no existía antes de que el programa se creara. Hay gente que sea capaz de hacer matemáticas, de echar código y que haya una empresa y entienda cómo se hacen las cosas. Ese es el sentido de un matemático aplicado o un científico de la computación. Y esa es la generación de gente que tenemos que formar porque ustedes son los que van a, a mover la tecnología. Eh, ya cuando nosotros ya, ya vayamos de salida, ustedes son los que van a mover esto. Listo. Muchísimas gracias a todos. Si hay preguntas, comentarios... ¿Listo? Entonces, la, la siguiente semana está la presentación de Gabriel. Yo no tengo comentarios adicionales. del tiempo creo que está bien manejado. Eh, y nos vemos la otra semana, Gabriel. Y vale, nos está profe. contando lo que necesite para lo del viaje. ¿Listo? Listo, profe. Profe, una última cosa. ¿Cuándo hay que enviar el documento? Ya le acabo de enviar un correo diciendo todo. Ah, listo. Vale, muchas gracias. Listo. Bueno, bueno. Entonces, saludos a todos. Gracias. Gracias a todos. Gracias. gracias.